Okay, good morning. Chapter 15, verse 7 in Bereshis, portion of Lech Lecha. We're learning after the war, following the war of the four kings and the five kings, it says that Hashem appeared to Avraham, to Abraham, and he made promises to him, your seed will be great. And we go on to read today about the famous portion of the Bris Bein Hapsorim, of the covenant which God Almighty entered into with Abraham to give him what we call today the land of Israel. This is a very famous fundamental watershed section in Jewish life. Vayomere <clears throat> Lavi said to him, Ani Hashem, I am Hashem, Asher Sicha, who brought you forth, Me Ur Kazdim, from Ur of the Shaldis, meaning from Iraq. Avram, Abraham, was born and grew up in Iraq. Hashem says, I am the God who brought you, good morning, from Ur, Losses Lecha, in order to give to you, Es Ha'oretz Hazais, this land, Lirishta, as an inheritance, and this is what I'm going to be doing now. I'm going to be establishing a treaty, a covenant with you, that your descendants forever and ever and ever will have Eretz Yisrael. Verse 8, by Yomar, and he said, Avram, Abraham said to God, Hashem Elohim, Hashem my God, Bamo Eida, how will I know Ki Iroshenno that in fact I will inherit it? Give me a sign. Give me something in the material realm which will tell me that this is in fact happening. And uh, as we learned yesterday, that in fact, Abraham's question was more in what merit will this happen? Not so much give me a sign, but explain to me what merit we will have in order to allow this great promise to be actualized. And the answer, as we learned in yesterday's Rashi, is in the merit of sacrifices which will be offered by the Jewish people in the Holy Temple in the Beis Hamikdash. Verse 9, by Yomere love, so he said to him, Kecholi Eglo Mishuleshes, take three calves for me. Rashi points out this does not mean, as the translator says, a three year old calf, but in fact it means Eglo Mishuleshes, three calves, the A's Mishuleshes, and three goats, the Ayo Mishulosh, and three rams, the Seir, as well as a Turtle dove, a gazel, and a young pigeon, an older pigeon, a young pigeon. So this was the shopping list. Nine, Egla Mishuleshes Shlesha Golem. This refers to three remes. This is an allusion representing Lishlesha Porim to three different bulls which were offered later by the descendants of Abraham in the Holy Temple. Par Yem Akipurim, there's the famous bull offered on Yom Kippur. Ufar helam dover shel and there's the bull when the entire community sins, the egla arufa, and there's the whole ceremony of breaking the neck of the calf when a man is found dead in the middle of nowhere. This is representative of these three segments of symbolic rituals and offerings having to do with egla. The A's Mishuleshes and three goats, Remes, this is an allusion to La Soyer, to the goat, Tanase Bifnim, that was offered within the Holy Temple. Presumably, he's referring to the goat of Yom Kippur, which uniquely the blood was, whose blood was sprinkled within the Holy and then you have the goats of the Musaf service, and the special festivals, and the individual goat transgression offering. These are the various goats that are referred to here when these three goats 
are ordered here to be part of this list. The Ayol Mishulosh and three Ayols, rams. Osham Vadai. This is symbolic of a guilt offering when one is certain one committed a transgression. The Osham Toli, an uncertain guilt offering. The Chapsa Shalchatos Yochid and a sheep offering for the transgression of an individual. Again, all symbolic of future offerings which the descendants of Abraham would bring in the Holy Temple. The Teir Begezel, these pigeons and birds, referring to Teir Ben Yena, the various pigeon offerings, older pigeons, younger pigeons, offered for various situations in the Beis Hamigdush. So this is the list that Abraham, <coughs> that Abram was commanded to take. Ten, Vayikach Loi Eskoleila, he took all of these. He took the animals and he did, as Rashi will explain, what was customary back then when they entered into covenants and treaties. For example, today when there's a treaty, a peace treaty signed, there's also a culture. They take pictures on the White House lawn. That's the culture. Back then, they took an animal, cut it in half, and walked in between the two halves of the animals. That was the culture of entering into a treaty at that time. So, he took all of these, and divided them down the middle. And each one laid his side over against the other. These were the animals. But the birds were not cut up. Ten Rashi vayevatere sam chile kolecha the shnei halokim. He divided each one into two parts. The ein hamikrayetz in b'dei pshutay. Despite the fact that all of this section is filled with symbolism, it also happened literally, as it says. The fi shahayakeres brisi may being that Hashem was entering into a covenant with him lahedish levona besoritz to cause his sons to inherit the land. Kidiksiv, as it says. By Yehima, who on that day Karas Hashem as Abraham brish lemer God entered into a covenant with Abraham. And the manner of covenant making back then was lechalik behema to divide an animal velaver and to cross over bein besoreha between its two halves kemosh and emer lahalon as it says later haevrim bein bisrahego as it says in Jeremiah those who cross between the halves of the heifer apkan so also here also tanur oshon we learn about a smoking furnace. The lapidation, a flaming torch. Asher Ovar, which passed through Ben Hagzorim between the two pieces. Who? This symbolism of the furnace and the torch represents Shluchai, is the representation, the messenger, the emissary, Shalshkina of the divine presence, Shehi Eish, which to us is manifested as a flame. Yes, Hatsipar Levosar, but he did not cut up the birds. The symbolism here is, is that the nations of the world, the idolatrous pagan nations of the world, they are likened to bulls, rams, and goats. Shenemar, King David expresses it beautifully, poetically, in chapter 22 of the Psalms, where he says, Svavuni porim rabim, many bulls have surrounded me. I feel like I'm surrounded by a bunch of raging bulls. That's the nations of the world surrounding and threatening the Jewish people. The Yemer, it says in Daniel, the various representations and symbolism of the vision. The ram, which you saw in the dream, has, has two horns. What are these two horns? Representing the kings of Medea and Persia. Horns threatening the Jewish people. The Yemer, Vatsofir, Hasoir, Melech Yavon, and the rough male goat is the king of Greece. So these are the various animals, the Israel and the Jewish people. Nimshulu are likened, Liyena to a dove. As it says in Shir Hashirim, Yenosi Bechag Ve'asela, my dove is in the cleft of the rock. So therefore the symbolism is, Lefikach therefore, Bosar HaBehemus, he cuts the animals, meaning Shalev De Kechavim of the pagan idolaters, these nations who attack and abuse the Jewish people, ultimately, they will all eventually perish. 
the Esatzipur, but the bird representing the Jewish people, Levosar, well, was not divided. Ramaz, this illusion is, she Yisrael, Kayom in La'elam, that the Jewish people are an eternal people. They may be a little tiny bird, a little tiny pigeon, but they outlast the bulls and the goats and the rams, and this is the eternity of Klal Yisrael. So now, this was taking place, and what happens is that Vayedet Ha'ayit Al Hapgorim, that the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, because when there's blood, the birds of prey come down and attack. And this is also symbolic. Vayashiv Esam Avram, Avram drove them away. Rashi Ha'ayit, who, if it's a type of bird, Hashem Shuhuot being that it flies, and seeks carcasses, to rush upon the food, upon the halves, unfit pieces, So there's a confusion here between piece and half. Because they're two different words. In any event, the birds of prey came swooping down upon the carcasses. Causing the wind to blow. What is the symbolism of this? It's not just that there was dead carcasses. There were dead carcasses and the birds of prey came down. All, that may have happened, but all of this is symbolic. That the birds of prey come to attack. Ramaz, this is an illusion. David ben Yishai That David, King David, David ben Yishai will come to destroy the nations of the world and once and for all bring peace into the world, which in fact he did to some extent because his son Shlomo was called Shlomo HaMelech. Melech Shah Sholom Shalo, he brought peace into his time, but it was not a permanent peace. But he was not permitted to do so from heaven. Until the time of the arrival of Mashiach, and that will be the final permanent peace. Until that time, the nations of the world will continue to harass and intimidate the lone dove. Going on now with the story here. Vayhi Hashem as the sun was about to go down, with Tardemo Nofla Avram. Suddenly, Avram, Abraham, fell into a very deep sleep. Vahine, in this sleep, a terrible fear and dread, and fell upon him. He felt overwhelmed with fear and dread. What was he experiencing? He was experiencing... Rashi, v'hine eima, remez, this terror within his slumber represented litzoris, v'cheshech shogolis, the troubles and darkness of exile. The Balaturim brings down that there are two similar verses, v'hi Hashem eshlove, and there's another verse, symbolizing the first and second Beis Hamikdash that they would set and they would be destroyed, the sun would set, and they would be destroyed by the enemies of the Jewish people. So this is this vision. 13. Let me just take a look here very quickly. There is this verse, and then there's Vayhi Hashem Bo, says the Balaturim. Okay. 13, by Yemer Avram, and he said to Avram, you shall surely know, you must know, that your children will be strangers, be Eretz Lohem in a land that is not theirs. And they, the people who will be enslaving them, will enslave them, be Inuasam, and torment them and afflict them. Arba Meis Shona, 400 years. So this is being stated right here that for 400 years your children will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and they will be afflicted. Now, by way of introduction, 
This event is happening before the 400 years. From the moment Abraham's son was born, Avram's son, referring to his legacy son, Yitzchak, Yitzchak was born on the 15th day of Nisan, exactly 400 years to the second before the exodus from Egypt. So therefore, although technically, in fact, as it happened, the Jewish people were only in Egypt for a total of 210 of those 400 years, but still, for 400 years, from the moment Abraham had a child, his children were strangers in a land that was not theirs because Israel had not yet actually belonged to the Jewish people, only promised. And that is the explanation of the 400 years. So we have various numbers here. One number is 400 years. The other number is 210 years. The 190 years between the 210 and the 400 represents the 190 years that passed from the time Yitzchak was born until the time that Yaakov descended into Egypt. Very simple calculation. It says that Yitzchak was 60 years old when Yaakov and Esau was born. The Yitzchak ben Shishim Shona Beledes Esau. And then when Yaakov comes to Egypt, Pharaoh says, how old are you? And he says, I am 130. There's your 190. Then it says that Yaakov lived in Egypt for 17 years. There's the 147. So that gives you the 190 plus the 210 makes 400. Now let's look at Rashi. 13, Kiger Yezaracha Mishaneilad Yitzchak, from the time Yitzchak was born, Atche Yatsu Yisrael Mimitzrayim, until the Jewish people went out of Egypt, Arba Meyashone, makes 400 years. Ketzan, how does this work? Yitzchak ben Shishim Shona Kishaneilad Yaakov, Yitzchak was 60 years old when Yaakov was born, Biyakiv Kishiar Limitzrayim, Amma Yemeshne Migurash Leishim Ashona. And when Yaakov descended down to Egypt, he said to Pharaoh, I am 130 years old. 130 plus 60 is 190. Harei kuf O be Mitzrayim hayu masayim bo hayu masayim bo eser keminyan redu. And they tarried in Egypt for 210. That's the numerical value of the word. Redu go down. Reish is 200. Dalid vav is 4 plus 6 210. Harei arba meyashon vim tamer. And if you say be Mitzrayim hayu arba meyashon, you're going to insist. That if the verse says 400 years, it must be 400 years. Not so. Impossible. Mathematically, it doesn't work. And here he goes on to explain why. One of the people who descended to Egypt was Kehos. Save Achashev, go calculate. Shneisov shel Kehos. All the entire years of the lifespan of Kehos. Vishal Amram and Amram. Ushmenim shel Mesha. And the 80 of Moshe. Moshe was 80 years old when he left. The total of everybody's lifespan, beginning to end, put together, including the 80 of Moshe, is 350. Obviously, it doesn't work that way, because a father lives X amount of years until his son is born, so that you don't count the entire lifespan of the father and son and grandson. Therefore, you must say, that if we want to talk about 400 years, it's from the moment of the birth of Yitzchak. Now remember, we talked yesterday about the fact, and we'll read about it a little bit later, that when Og Melech Haboshim, the Medrash says, when Og Melech Haboshim came to Avram to tell him he was eating matzah, that it was around Pesach time, that Yitzchak was... This, this took place Pesach, Yitzchak was born Pesach, the Jewish people left Pesach. This is all about the Pesach season over a span of many years. The Eretz Leilohem, Eretz Mitzrayim, in fact, it doesn't say that you will be strangers in Egypt for 400 years. It says in a land that's not theirs. From the moment that Yitzchak was born, Avram lived as a stranger here and there and everywhere. 
Good morning. So this is the simple interpretation of the number talked about here, 400. The uh, Balaturim here says on 13 that ki ger, look at the last letter of those two words, ki ger, yud resh or resh yud, that's the 210. Verse 14, don't think that Egypt will just get away with it. The gam es asher yavedu, and even the nation whom they will serve, don anechi, I'll judge them as well. So that you don't just oppress and afflict Jewish people and get away with it. They're going to have to pay the pipe. And afterwards, at the end of that time, Yetzu, the Jewish people, will come forth with tremendous wealth. As we know that 210 years later, when the Jewish people left Egypt, they left with the wealth of Egypt. 14, Vigam es Vigam, the word Vigam, is representative, the rabbis, inclusive of Dalit Malchias. Not only the story of the Egyptian bondage, but all the kingdoms over all the years who afflicted the Jewish people. Sha'af Haim, Kolim, they will also perish. Why? Al Shashibdu Es Yisrael, because they enslaved Israel. Don Anoichi, I will judge them, Be'eser Makus, the ten plagues. Birchush Godel, in simple terms, Be'momen Godel, the Jewish people will leave. Egypt with great wealth. They despoiled Egypt. They emptied Egypt of their wealth at the end of their time there. Now, Hashem is speaking to Abraham. And you, you will die and return to your forefathers in peace. You're not going to live to see this. This is many, many years later. You will be buried in ripe old age. Rashi, you're not going to see all of this. Rashi says, what kind of promise is that to a righteous man? That you're going to return to your forefathers in peace. His forefathers were idolaters. That's not a very good promise. Who knows where he's going to go? He says, his father was an idol worshiper. As we say in Yiddish, I get some dinner. Vasra is informing him, love that he's going to come back to his father. That's not such good news. Limetcha, this is a biblical source which teaches us Sha'osa Terach Chuva. That Terach in his old age returned to Hashem and repented and says, I acknowledge I was an idolater, but I was only doing it for business. <laughs> I made a living. Terach had a big store, idols are us. In fact, Terach, in his old age, repented. Tikover beseva teva. Bisrei, another piece of good news. Hashem informs Avram here. Sheyase Yishmoel tshuva biyama. We're going to learn about the fact that Avram, in addition to marrying Sarah and having Yitzchak, also, by Sarah's suggestion, took Hagar as a concubine wife. And she had Yishmoel. And Yishmoel was a terrorist. Good morning. So that Yishmoel also repented in his old age. Furthermore, so Yishmoel also repented when Abraham was still living. Furthermore, another piece of good news is that Esav will not become a public sinner until Avram dies. Avram died at the age of 175, and Avram was 160 when Yaakov and Esau were born, so that Esau and Yaakov were 15 the day of the funeral, and that's when the whole birthright story happened with the Haliteni no mino ode mo ode mazeh, give me some of that uh, red stuff, and that was when they were 15 years old, and Asa was not a known sinner yet, so in fact, Abraham died in a ripe old age. 
His father repented before he died. His son repented and his grandson did not yet become a global terrorist. And therefore, the truth of the matter is, we're, we're taught that all of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were all supposed to live 180. It's just a good Jewish number. Ten Molchai. So Avram, in fact, did not live 180. He died five years early. Yitzchak did live 180. And Yaakov also died prematurely at 147 for a special reason. The only one who really came to his ripe old age was Yitzchak. Why did Avram die at 175? Because he died so that he can die in a ripe old age. So he should not see Esau become a terrorist. That's the day of the whole story with Esau and Yaakov where Esau went public in his wickedness. 16. Now Hashem promises Avraham that Vedeir Revi Yashuvu Heina. It's only a fourth generation that will come back here and inherit the promised land. Why? Because the sin of the Amorites is not complete until that point in time. There are two things that have to happen in order for the Jewish people to inherit the Canaanite lands. Thing number one is the Jews have to merit it and it has to be right time. The right time. Thing number two is that the Canaanite countries, the Canaanite people, have to have sinned enough for them to merit to be banished. For them to merit to be re removed. So that there are two components. Because Hashem in His perfection acts in perfection. So that the Canaanite kingdoms did not fall apart until the moment when their cup was filled with sin. 16. Once the Jewish people will be exiled into Egypt, Yusham, they will be there, Gimel Deiris, three generations. Varavi, in the fourth generation, Yeshua will return. Laurat Sazes to this land. Because, of course, Hashem was speaking to Abraham at this point in time in Canaan, in Israel. And entered into this covenant, as it says, I'm giving you this land to inherit. That's exactly what happened. Yaakov, Jacob himself, descended into Egypt. And go and calculate generations. You had Yaakov's son Yehuda, Peretz, Chetzron, and Kolev, who's the son of Chetzron, Miboya Oretz Hoya, entered into Israel. That's the fourth generation. That they should be sent out and removed, that I say is man until that time, because the rule is very important. Hashem does ne never punishes a nation until its measure is filled. As it says in Yeshayahu, Bisaso Bishalcho Triveno, in full measure when you send her away, that's when you contend with her, referring to the enemies of the Jewish people. Punishment comes when punishment should come. The Deiravi Yashuvu Heino says the Balaturim refers to Vov Resh Yud Ridu two ten, the first letter of those three words. And then, Heino, then they will come back. So you have Vider, Revi, Yashubu, Izredu, and then Heino. That's the Balatur. 17, Vahi Hashem Eshbo, and as the sun was coming down, Vahaloto Hoya, good morning, Vihine, and there was a darkness, Vihine, and behold, there was Tanur Eish, a smoking furnace, Vilapid Eish, and a flaming torch, Asher Ovar, which passed, between the pieces. This is what we referred to earlier, representing the Shekhinah. This is the grammar, the grammatical usage, like it says later, and when they emptied their sacks. This happened. The day became dark. This is a hint, an illusion. That all of the kingdoms that will oppress the Jewish people will ultimately fall into purgatory, hell. That they're going to have to pay the price for all of their wickedness, representing the fiery furnace. 
Tamer Lamaila, the accent is on the first syllable. The Kachom Avayashim Bo Akbar already. Vim Haya Tamer Lamata Malaf. If the accent was on the second syllable, Hayim Avayir Kishehi Sheikas Setting. Vyef Shalem Akein Shari Karksi because it says Vyef Shemesh Lavi it was setting. Avoras Tanur Oshin Lachem Bikan Hoisa and the passing of the smoking furnace was later. Nimtza Shekvar Shokov Ezechil B'Chol Teva Loshin Akeva. She said Yishtei Yisis. This is the difference. With every feminine gender word, which has two letters in the root, come ba kom shav shatam lamaila, when the accent is on the first syllable, lashon over it's past. Ki goin zeh, ki goin berachel ba kom alamosi in a shava yivim tech. Ok shatam lamato when the accent is on the second syllable, ho lashon heve dabe shenasa achshe behelach. It's present tense happening now. Ki me ba imatzein bo erev he ba ova beker he shava. That's what Theodor Bikel says. The Hungarians always put the accent on the wrong syllable. 18. By Yehim Ahu on that day, Koras Hashem Es Avram Bris Lamer. On that famous day, Hashem, God Almighty, entered into a covenant with Abraham, saying, Lizaracha to your seed, Nosati, I have already given. Consider it given. Es Haoretz Hazes, this land, Minahar Mitzrayim, from the river of Egypt, Ad Hanohor Hagodol, Nahar Pros, to the great river, the Euphrates, so that the Israel promised to Avram was a great span of Israel from way south to way north. There are maps in various Chomoshim which show Israel as promised to Avraham, which will not be realized in totality until Mashiach comes because it includes many of the surrounding countries that are there now. Rashi. Why does it say, I have given, when he's talking about only transferring it Many years later, because when Hashem says something, it's as if it was done. Why is the Euphrates River called the Great River? It's not so great because it's attached to a description of Israel. It's described as great. It's the last of the four rivers, which come forth from Eden, as it says with creation. the fourth river. There's a common proverb. People say, that the servant of a king is like a king. Attach yourself to a captain, and people will bow down to you. The Euphrates is attached to Israel. It has become great. Now here we find that there are ten nations enumerated, but in fact we talk about seven nations. The three nations will come about when Mashiach comes. Kabbalistically speaking, we also talk about the ten nations representing the ten soul powers, representing the ten attributes. Chachma binodas, chesed gura tiferes, netzach hod yesod and malchus. The Kani and the Knizi and the Kadmoni in verse 19 represent Chachma, Bina, Das, which doesn't come about until Mashiach comes. Let's learn now 19, Vesha Kani, Vesha Knizi, Vesha Kadmoni. These are the three nations which have not yet happened. I believe it includes all the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. Vesha Chiti, Vesha Prizi, Vesha Rafoim. So you have here the ten nations, seven plus three. There are ten nations. In fact, he only gave them seven. Which are the other three? Edom, Moab, the Ammon, Haim. They are Kani, Knizi, and Kadmoni. When are we going to have those? When Mashiach comes. Shanamar, as it says in Isaiah, and that is yet to come about. There's a lot more to be said about the ten nations, the seven nations, the three nations, but we'll keep going. That already refers to Eretz Og, what we call Transjordan. That's the king of the, he, Og was the king of the giants. So that's the famous portion of of the bris ben Absorim, the covenant between God Almighty and Avraham Avinu. One more balaturim quickly on 17. Va'alot hoya v'hine sanur says the balaturim that you look at the first letter of those four words. Va'alot hoya v'hine sanur backwards is tohu. 
that Hashem showed Abraham the confusion of exile, all the tzoros and all of the confusion which will take place. Now we segue to chapter 16, and we move on in time. The Sorai Ashes Abram, Sorai, Abram's wife, Lo Yolda Lo, she was barren, she had no children. The Lo Shivcha Mitzris, and she had an Egyptian handmaid, Ushmo Hagar, whose name was Hagar. Why does he say Shivcha Mitzris? Who needs to know where she comes from? So Rashi tells us from the Medrash. Chapter 16, verse 1, Shivcha Mitzris Bas Parei Hoysa. In fact, she was a princess. She was Pharaoh's daughter. But she was a great person. Kishara Nisim, when she saw the miracles, Shanasu the Sora that happened to Sora, when Sora was taken to Pharaoh's palace and miraculously survived and came out without a scratch, Omar, she said, This is serious stuff. Or he said, Better my daughter should be a handmaid in the house of this great tzaddik and not a princess in another house. So Hagar was actually an Egyptian princess and as our sages say, a very great soul. Verse 2, Matemer Sorai El Avram so having been barren for so many years, Sorai says to Avram, Hine no atzorani Hashem iledes. Behold, Hashem has held me back from bearing children, and I know that I'm suffering, but why should you suffer? Be no el shivchosi. Why don't you take my maid as a concubine? Ulai ibone mimena, maybe I will be built up through her. So he recommended, so she, Sorai, recommended to Avram that she take, that he take Hagar as a concubine. Ayishma Avram, Lekel Sorai, and Avram listened to the voice of Sorai. Verse 2. Ulai ibone mimena, perhaps I will be built up through her. Lima, this teaches us, this language teaches us. Almisha in lebonim, that if somebody has no children, Shaina Bori, not only is he not built up, Elahorus, he's torn down. Shh. Vakasha. Ibone mimena, bischus, sha'achnis, tsarosi, the seich base, Hashem will see the tremendous sacrifice that I am making that I am bringing another woman into my house, perhaps that sacrifice will send a message and Hashem will send blessing to me. Lekel Sorai, Leruach HaKodesh Sorai, Sora was a prophetess and she had, she was imbued with divine spirit. She was a Nevi'ah. So she knew that it was destined for Avram and Hagar to bear children, specifically Yishmuel. Verse 3, Vatikach Sorai Eishas Avram, and Sorai, Avram's wife, took Es Hogar Hamitzis, Hogar the Egyptian, Shifchosa, her handmaid. When was this? Miketz Eser Shonim Lesheves Avram, Beatitz Canaan, at the end of ten years of Abraham having dwelled in the land of Canaan. And she gave her Avram Isha to Avram, her husband, Leila Isha, to him as a concubine wife. Now we learn a lot of things from this verse. First of all, chronology. Avram, we learned at the beginning of Lech Lecha, was 75 years old when he came, when he left Choron and came to Eretz Yisrael. Ten years goes by, he's 85 years old. And then another year goes by, and Hagar has a child. So that would make Yishmoel born when Avram was about 86 years old. Yitzchak was born when Avram was 99, 100 years old. That's why he was 13, 14 years older than Yitzchak. 
She persuaded her with words. Sarai said to Hagar, How fortunate are you, Shezachis Lidovic, that you were privileged to be joined with this holy man. There's another thing we learn from here. <clears throat> Today you have fertility clinics. Today there's every test in the world and every application in the world. But back then, this science was not that evolved. So, the set time which our sages established that if a man is married to a woman and she doesn't bear children, 10 years, then he can, or others will say, he must marry another one because of the great mitzvah of bringing children into this world. Now, even though they were married for many more than 10 years, this teaches us that their dwelling outside of Israel didn't count. Ten years in Israel. Until he came to Eretz Yisrael. So now, Hagar is his concubine wife. Verse 4, by Yovayel Hagar, and he lived with Hagar, Vatar, and she conceived. Now, Sorai did not conceive. Hagar did. Bateda Kiarosa, when Hagar saw that she conceived, Batekel Gvirta Beina, and her boss, her mistress, became despised or disrespected in her eyes. She said, if, she, if I have a child and my mistress doesn't, then I am holier than she is. Maybe I should be the mistress. The first union that they had. She said, Obviously, this Sorai ain't Sisra Kigluya. She's not the same in her essence as she is in the open. Obviously. Or she would have children. She presents herself as if she's a righteous woman. She's obviously not. She was not privileged to conceive. She was married to Avram for so many years and never conceived. And one union I had with Avram and I conceived. Needless to say, she didn't realize that many great righteous women were barren, at least for a time, and that it's not necessary. Her logic was not necessarily correct. Five, So Sorai says to Abraham, I am being wronged here. I placed my handmaid into your bosom. And what, how am I being repaid? With disrespect. Because she saw that she conceived. Now I am being disrespected and despised by her. May judge, may Hashem, may God Almighty judge between me and you. The wrong done to me. I'm putting it on your head. Why? What did he do wrong? Because obviously when you, my husband, prayed to God and you said, What good is all the blessings if I am childless? You didn't have me in mind. You only prayed for yourself. Because obviously she's pregnant. From you. You should have prayed for both of us. I would have been remembered by God with you. That's what happened to Avram's son, Yitzchak and Rivka, prayed together, and she conceived. The eight, furthermore, Dvarecha atachei you're stealing from me your words, because you hear her talking to me with disrespect, and you're not saying anything. This has an extra yud. That Sarai cast an evil eye into the pregnancy of Hagar, and she miscarried. And that's why it says later that when she was found by the angel, you will conceive. How could he say you will conceive if she already conceived? She lost the first child. The angel is informing her that she will, 
Ela Malamit, she pila heroi in her that she miscarried the first one. So Sorai gets totally upset here at what's going on. Now again, we know we should not take this story very lightly because Sorai or Sora was a great prophet, prophetess and she saw a lot deeper than the simple story. Verse 6, So Abram says to Sorai, Behold, your handmaid is yours. Do whatever you wish with her. Vatanel Sora and Sora dealt harshly with her. She imposed discipline. Vativrach mi ponel until Hagar ran away. Vatanel Sora hay mishabedes babekeishi. She made her work hard. Seven as Hagar runs away, vayimtza malach Hashem al ein hamoyim bamidbar. An angel of God encounters her by the fountain of water in the desert. Al haayin by the fountain, but they're sure on the way to Shur. Vayomar, Vayomar, and he said, Hogar, Shivcha Sorai, Hogar, handmaid of Sorai, Amy Zebos, from where are you coming? Vana Telechen, where are you going? Vatemer, and she said, Mipne Sorai, Gvirti, Onechi Bayrachas, I'm running away from my mistress, Sorai. Eight, Amy Zebos, Mehechem Bos, from where? He's an angel, he was sent for a reason. Yedeah, Hoya, he knew. El Alitin La Pesach, the Konasim Bador, and this was to enter pleasantly into conversation. Where? The angel of God said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her. Take it. Great blessing is coming through this. We keep finding repetition of the words and the angel of God said to her that God kept sending angel after angel. Every statement has the word malach. Ten, another angel said to her, I will greatly multiply your seed. I guess we have, what, 23 Arab countries? Pretty good blessing. There will be such abundance it will be impossible to number them. An angel of God said to her, You're about to conceive, and you're going to bear a child, and you shall name him Yishmoel. Yishmoel comes from the word to listen, to hearken. Because Hashem heard your affliction. When you return, you will conceive. This is a command. It's like you say to a male, and you shall call. The Karos is the female equivalent of that. The who, and this child, Yihia, will be Pere Odom, a real wild guy. Yodei Bakel, his hand will be all over everybody. The Yad Kel and everybody will contend with him. The Al Pnechol Ech of Yishkein. And in the face of all of his brethren, he will dwell. Pere Odom, Eyev Midboris, he will love the wilderness, Lotzud Chayas, he'll be a hunter of wild animals, Kamesh Kosov, by Hirevi Kashos, he's shooting the bow, by Yeshev B. Midbar Poran. Yodei Bakel, Listin, robbery, the Yad Kel Bey, Hakel Seyinesi, everybody will hate him, Umazgorim Bey, and attack him. The Al Pnechol Ech of Yishkein, Sheyye Zare Godol, he'll have many children. Thirteen, Vatikra Hashem Hashem Adevar Elel. So she called the name of Hashem, the name of the angel who spoke with her. Ato you Kel Roi are the God of seeing. Ki Omra because she said Hagam Halim Roi Si Achrei Roi. It's amazing that even here I merited to see angels. Ato Kel Roi Nokut Chat of Comets. The vocalization is with a Chat of Comets. Im Neishu Hashem Dov because it's a noun. Elokai Horia, God of seeing, Shereya Be'el Ben Shalaluvim, who sees the shame of those that are humbled. Hagam Halayim Lashon Tema, Chisvura Yisi Shaf Halayim B'Midbaras Yisi Shuk Shamakam. Would I ever think that even here in the wilderness I would see the emissaries of of Hashem? Achrei Reya Yisam B'Vesi Shal Avram, after having been accustomed to seeing them in the house of Avram, Shesham there I Yisi to Gil Olus Malachim. There I was accustomed to seeing angels. Teda and the proof is shows to the Gilda Reisim Shrei Manoach Ras Malach as Hamalach because we read that Manoach later 
saw an angel, Pamachas, one time, the Yomar, and he said, Mace Nomas, I'm going to die. I saw an angel. Vizur also Dawid Zachazen. Hogar sees four consecutive angels. Vilei and it doesn't do anything to her. So she's calm because she was accustomed in the house of Abraham to see angels. 14, Al Kain Korolaber, Be'er Lachai Roi. That's why they named this fountain, the fountain of Lachai Roi. Hini Ben Kodesh, Ben Borod. It is between Kodesh and Borod. Rashi, Be'er Lachai Roi, Kitagumi, Be'er de Malach Kayoma, Itachazay Allah. The well that the living angel appeared near. 15, Vatelet Hogar Lavram Bain, and Hogar gave birth to Avram, a son. Vayikra Avram Shem Ben Asher Yodel Lahogar Yishmo, and Avram named the son born to Hogar Yishmo. Vayikra Avram Shem, Vigay Marashi, Apa Pishle Shom Avram Dibram Al Shomer, even though Avram didn't hear the words of the angel who said, Vikaros Shme Yishmo, who said to Hogar, You shall name him Yishmo, Shor Saru Hakadish Olaf. He was filled with divine spirit, Ukroi, and he called him Yishmoel. There's a famous teaching that parents are imbued with divine spirit when they name their child. The Avram ben Shmeinim Shona b'shei Shona Avram was 86 years old, beledes Hagar as Yishmoel. The Avram when Hagar bore Yishmoel for Avram. Avram b'shmeinu Shona l'shivche shel Yishmoel nichtab. This is actually a compliment to Yishmoel, l'idea to inform us, that he was 13 years old when he was circumcised, because when Abraham was 99, he was 13, and he didn't object. This was his bar mitzvah gift. He says, guess what I'm getting you for your bar mitzvah, a bris. Chapter 17, verse 1, Avram was 99 years old. And Hashem appeared to Avram, and he said to him, I am God Almighty. His halech lefonai walk before me, the heye sum him and be wholehearted. Rashi, we're skipping now 13 years. Ani kel shadai, ani hushiyesh dai beli husi lechol birya. I have sufficient divinity for every creation. Lefiko, therefore, his halech lefonai walk before me, the eye lechon I will be to you, lelaka as a to, as a god, or le patron and as a protector. The chain kol mokim shuba mikra. Whenever it says the word Shaddai, Perushi, Kach, Dai, Shalei, Hashem has sufficient power, Bahaka Lefiyo, fitting the context. His Halech Lefonik, Targumai, Plach Kadomai, worship before me, Hidovik, Bavidosi, connect yourself to my service. The Heye Somim, Abzet, Sibra, Achatsibra, one command following the other. Heye Sholim, be complete. Bechol Nis Yenais, I pass all of my tests. We know that Abraham passed 10 tests. Well, if Medrashi, the Medrash says that how should you be complete? Through circumcision. Yisalech lefonai, walk before me. The mitzvah's milah, the mitzvah of circumcision. Obadavar hazeh, tiyitomim, and through this you will be perfect. Shekos man sha'orla, as long as there is the uncircumcised body, the foreskin, atabal mum lefonai, you're considered incomplete. And there can't be a total dwelling of the divine presence. Dabar achar veheyei tomim, another interpretation. As Rashi says, that the circumcision will make you complete. And I'm going to add a, a, a hey, and you're going to have five more numbers to your name, and this will complete you through the process of circumcision. The etna tu brisi, and I will establish my covenant between me and you. And I will exceedingly multiply your descendants. A covenant of love, because there was a love affair between Avram and Hashem, and Hashem and Avram. The covenant of the land. That this mitzvah, bris, will be the vehicle which will enable you to inherit the land. Verse 3, Vayipal Avram al Ponav, and Avram fell on his face. Vayidabari Telukim, Lamer and Hashem spoke with him, saying, Rashi, Vayipal Avram al Ponav, me made Ashkina from the great fear of the divine presence. Sha'achle Mola, Hoya Bekeach, Lamed, because up until the time of circumcision, Avram struggled with revelation because his body was not holy. The Ruach HaKedish Nitzebis Olav, and the Holy Spirit would hover over him. We find something similar with Bilam, who was a prophet, but he was an uncircumcised person. Nefel, 
When God appeared to him, he was falling down with open eyes. His body couldn't tolerate the revelation. Once Abraham was circumcised, he became a vehicle and a chariot to Hashem. Verse 5, Your name will no longer be Avraham, it will become Avraham. Because I will make you a father of a multitude of nations. This is sort of an allusion in the name. Av Hamon Goyim is Avraham. Avram was always famous, but he was a father to his local neighborhood. And now Avram became a father of the entire world. Nevertheless, the Reish did not move Sha'af Yud Shel Sarai. Nisram al Ashkina, because the Yud of Sarai became upset. The Yud was given to Yeshua. As it says, Shenem, Arba Yikram Eshele Shea Benun Yeshua, that Moshe renamed Hoshea Yehoshua. Where did he get the Yud from? Say our sages from Sarai's Yud. Six, we appraise Yeshabim Meid Meid, and I will multiply you exceedingly, Unasatiha Legoyim, and transform you into many nations, Umelachim, Mimcho Yetzeyu, and many kings will come forth from you. Rashi and Satiha Legoyim, Yisrael, the Jewish people, the Edom and Edom, in addition to Yishmol, Shari Yishmol, Kvar Hoyole, he already had Yishmol, Lehoyim of Asriel, he was not talking about Yishmol. So who are the nations? The great nations are Israel and Rome. End of portion.